The NFL is here, and it's all about the sweet offers from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can pocket $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just 5 bucks on any NFL game. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code FIELDGOAL to sign up. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash football for eligibility, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yep. Yeah, it's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard. And I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah, I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. NFL Sunday Ticket is now on YouTube and YouTube TV, which means that you can stay close to your team even if you don't live in their town. Like, maybe you're a Raven who married a Seahawk who got a job in the land of the Falcons. With NFL Sunday Ticket, you can watch your team's out-of-market Sunday afternoon games no matter where you live because you shouldn't have to change teams even if you change towns. NFL Sunday Ticket, now on YouTube and YouTube TV. Go to youtube.com slash presale to get $50 off. Terms and embargoes apply. Offer ends 919. No refund. Subscription auto renews. Hello and welcome back to the Paddock and the Pavilion with me, your host, Stephen Wallace, for our final Birdsville Races podcast with racegoer Andrew Redston on the eve of the Birdsville Cup. Andrew was previously on episode 149 on the road to Birdsville Races. In the first of two halves, recorded in October 2022, Andrew reflected on his Birdsville races experience, the rain and how the journey to the outback, 10,000 kilometres in Andrew's case, helped him on a personal level after a tough few years. Andrew's outback adventure included a trip to the Fred Brophy boxing tent, not what you usually get up to at the races. While in the second half, Andrew told us why he decided to return to Birdsville in 2023, including a surprise advertisement for his vehicle. Andrew, how special was the week in Birdsville leading up to race day? Well, we got there on the Sunday, Stephen. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll pack it up um, where we're going to camp. We decided to just to camp up back away from the river, which turned out to be a pretty pretty um, strategic move because the rain came in on the Wednesday and we got there on the Sunday and we decided to park up on the hill because it was warm. And my original theory was, was, was to stay away from the reeds because of the snakes. <laughs> um, but as it turned out, um, if we had a camp down in the bottom, we would have got flooded in. Our camp would have been floating down the Dimitina River. And some of the, the bigger vehicles had kept an eye on the, on the forecast and decided to move out of that area, the lower part of the ground, to get higher ground. So we sort of watched with interest just to see what was happening. And, and the atmosphere around the camp was starting to build because there was a lot more trucks coming in, a lot more vehicles, uh, vans and, and campers, and they were popping up like mushrooms. So it was it was pretty good to watch, you know, given that we were one of the first into the camping area, watch people come and go, it was, it was good to watch. You know, there were some people that we met on the road and um, it, at, at Batuta, at the races there, and probably even as far back as, as Windor or maybe even Longreach, um, given the, the roadies' signs were on the cars, so we made sure we went and said g'day. And, um, that first few days was, was interesting. When the rain turned up, it become – it actually I think it actually helped the races, to be honest with you, because when – People, the, the pub was a little was a little scarce, and the streets were a little scarce right up to through to about Wednesday. People were staying in the camp and sitting around their their vans and the campfires and having a few beers around the camp. But when the rain come in, you couldn't sit around your campfire because you're going to get you're going to get soaked. So everybody went to the pub, which made I think actually turned the event into uh, the party that 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 was envisaged, envisaged what was supposed to happen. And it became really good. The live music, the rain was belting down. 
the pub was absolutely thumping, just full chock block full of people, and it actually made it really good. It made it really good, and I'm sure that the performers that were, you know, playing the guitars and, and singing were actually glad that the rain turned up. So that part so the great was community good. atmosphere then. I turned into a, a really good atmosphere, you know, because it was a little it was a little quiet in and around the town because people were camped everywhere. You, you, you're at the common ground, which is a couple of k's out of town, which there was a lot of people out there. And then you got the caravan park, which was actually wasn't as full as I thought it was going to be, but it was still there was still a lot of people in, in and around the area. And when the rain came in, it actually flooded the the, the common area. There was there's probably still there's probably vans still stuck there. It was soaked, absolutely soaked, turned into a river right throughout. And even part of our area was was people getting pulled out. Um, some of our guys pulled their got their four wheel drives and, and were towing people out of the area because it was so bogged in. So the atmosphere within the pub area and, and in that in the actual precinct of the town, it actually made it better. So I think the rain, from our point of view, um, added another element to to Birdsville. It was it was pretty cool. So were you able to keep dry yourself? <laughs> um, certainly not dry on the inside. Um, <laughs> but my my tent was fine. I, I you know it was it was pretty cool. And I had some stretches and and I, I had two camp stretches which I gave to um, a, a, a couple of the other fellas in the camp so they get their swags up off the ground. Um, but we we weren't far from the toilet block. I guess we were right at the base of the hill. And as we're cooking brekkie and making coffee, people are always stopping and saying good day. It was a really good atmosphere in, in our camp area. It was um, it was pretty. The rain made another element to it. I think it did, I think it made it better. Probably, I'm sure the organisers at the track didn't think so, um, but it did make it better. You mentioned the music. Uh, I understand talking to you before that um, you went to the Fred Bof- Brophy's uh, boxing tent yourself. I've always wanted to go and see Fred Brophy. I, I met him in Batuta and I was a little um, uh, starstruck, I guess, for the use of a better word. And I, I got, to, got went out a chat to him and I got to know him and quite a few of his uh, team members over the course of the week. Um, I've always wanted to go to the to the boxing tent. And within my crew, within the team that we, we travelled with and, and were setting up camp for, they were always egging me on to get in there and have a, have a crack. But... To be honest with you, Steve, I was always going to go in and have a go. I've, when I left home here back in Maui, um, in Victoria, I was I didn't want to go on my trip and leave anything that I've, I've come home and I said I should have done this or I should have done that. So in my mind, I was always going to go up and, and try the boxing. Now, I can't find my way out of a wet paper bag. So I put my hand up anyway and I went in and, and decided to go up and have a go at the boxing. When, <laughs> and when the boys come back from camp, they went back to get a few beers. They see me up on stage chatting to Fred and standing up there with the beaver and, and a few other, um, you know, hopefuls. Uh, they thought it was pretty cool. Anyway, we got in there. We we had uh, we had a box. Um, my box was probably pretty kind on me. Within the first 10 seconds, he, he landed one on the chin. I thought, hello, <laughs> I'm going to die here. But he... <laughs> You know, <laughs> I put the hands up and I, I was, you know, I, I got a couple of punches in, I suppose, and he was talking to me throughout and, and encouraging me and probably mouthing off a little bit too, the, the barrister. But he was a fantastic bloke and he, he got me one in the ribs in the second round and it hurt a little bit. And I didn't feel the, really feel it until I sat down and I was talking to one of the, the, the female boxers there that – um was going to fight the beaver and geez, I think he got me a beauty in the ribs. And it was really sore later that night for the next couple of mornings. Very, very sore. I was home for two weeks and he said, I might go for an x ray. And I found out I had four fractured ribs. <laughs> so, so it was pretty tough to, um, uh, very tough to sleep. You know, you're taking Nurofen and, and about 13 cans, 14 cans a day just to try and numb the pain. But, um, Anyway, the ribs, are, they're on the mend. They're not better yet, but they're certainly on <laughs> on the mend. But the Fred Brophy is something everyone's got to go and do. And, you know, if you're game enough to get up and have a fight, then, well, you know, good on you. That sounds interesting. There's not many people go to the races with uh, 
fractured ribs. And uh, talking of the races, what was it like when you uh, when racing finally got uh, underway? Because uh, racing was cancelled on the Friday because of the rain, and you started on the Saturday. Yeah, it was. We um, we weren't sure whether it was actually going to go ahead or not. Even up until the Friday, we still weren't sure whether it was going ahead. And um, we obviously found out Friday was cancelled on the Thursday. And then the sun popped out and the wind started to pick up again. So I was somewhat confident within camp that it was going to go ahead. And late, late Thursday, maybe even Friday morning, it was they decided that they were going to give it a, a red-hot crack to um, get the track in order. Well, you jump on the bus, you, you walk into town and, and there was a, 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 um, a shuttle of, you know, big buses that were going back and forth to the, to the course. It was pretty busy. Um, it's not the usual track preparation that you'd see <laughs> anywhere, but I'm not surprised how it was prepared given the amount of rain. The graders were taking the topsoil off probably down Three, four hundred uh, mil, I suppose, it's nearly half a meter in probably some areas. And they were, there was two of them going flat out around the track to, to try and clear it. Things were delayed two or three hours. It didn't really worry too many people because I think in the end, people were, were actually betting on which grader was going to come down the, down the straight first. <laughs> and it was actually pretty funny to watch, but it's not your usual track rep- preparation. And when the horses come out onto the track, there was a big cheer, you know, because everyone was that's what everybody came for was to go to the races and, and experience what um what Birdsville was going to provide. And I don't think it disappointed. The rain again added another element to it and it um made it a little bit more exciting, I guess. And and did you back the winner in the Birdsville Cup? Well, no, I went with John Keating again. See, he had um Strathari at, at Batuta, and I, I, I bailed him up. I said, mate, what's going on with that bloody horse of yours? He said, no, no good today, but followed up in Birdsville. So I followed up in Birdsville, but he got off it and got on got on to something else. So I should have got on the other the other thing that he got on. I'm not sure if he won it or not, but knowing that he got off got off it at Birdsville probably should have been an indicator for me not to back it. But um, <laughs> anyway, we're making the donation, so that's how it went. No, I didn't, didn't back the winner there, but we've got a couple throughout the day, which – Sort of paid for a few beers and had a bit of fun, so that's what it's all about. Yeah, well, John came second in the the Birdsville Cup, and he'll feature again on our podcast. Uh, now, race race day is over, and then you've got the the journey the journey home. You said you'd take a week to get home. Is that how it panned out? Well, just throughout the the rest of the week at Birdsville, it was the races were one element to it. Um, for me, there was Big Red I wanted to try and get up to. So we, we tried to drive the four wheel drive up Big Red, which I got about halfway up before my car got stuck. Um, there was the Fred Brophy, there was the, the races, and then there was the party. So there was there was a number of elements to Birdsville for me. It wasn't just the races. Um, I, wanted the, the, I wanted the Birdsville experience, as they say. And I think I, I covered um, a lot of ground much more ground than uh, I probably would have thought that I'd do and probably a lot more ground than most others would have done. The, the trip home for me, when I left on the Monday, we still weren't sure if a lot of the roads were open. And one of my ticket things also was to drive the Birdsville track. So I decided to, to um, head that way anyway. And it, it did open that morning, but it was for um, high four-wheel-based drive vehicles. Mine's a low four-wheel drive-based vehicle, but I needed to get out of was. I was probably going to get stuck because the rain was due to come again on the Tuesday and the Wednesday. The drive out to Mangarini, which is about 200 or 300 k's out of Birdsville, was a pretty rugged sort of a road. There was a lot of boggy areas, a lot of uh, creek crossings that were full of slush and mud and water. And my experience around four-wheel driving wasn't fantastic, but I made sure I stayed within eye distance of someone that, you know, within about 100 metres in front of me so I could follow their tracks out. And going through some of these things, I nearly got bogged twice. Um, I've, I lost sight of a windscreen wipers. When I finally found them, I was running almost straight into a pole. So, <laughs> so I was learning pretty quickly on where all, where all my gadgets were in the back of my car. 
it was one way a lot of the way because the second half of the road was was so boggy and, and muddy. When we got to Mangarini, from Mangarini back into Maori, the road was so much better and it was it was a smoother ride. Given I had four broken ribs, which I didn't know at the time, I was going to stay within the pub, but a bit pricey for that. So I ended up pulling the swag back off the road, off the roof, and went out the, behind the pub and, and set up, which was a little bit painful. However, um, we got to put up and we got to pull down again. And the next morning I, I drove out of Maree heading towards home. I thought, well, I was going to head towards Burke and Hay and head around a little bit more northern New South Wales, but I, I think I'd... I think I'd done enough. Um, my head was where I, I needed to, needed to be. I'd covered nearly. Uh, by the time I got home, it was just on ten thousand k's, and I think I'd done enough. So I decided just to to, to head home. So, but it was a shorter route home though, because you said you travelled eight thousand kilometres to to get to Birdsville. Yeah, and from home to Birdsville, still two thousand one hundred k's. You know, so it's, it's still a fair hike from Birdsville to my joint. But um, I was going to go, when I got to Mildura, I was going to head left and, and head towards northern New South Wales, but I just decided to keep going south and, and made a beeline for home. I, I, I think I'd, I was tired. I'd, I'd had enough. My ribs were sore. <laughs> and I was running out of, as most people do, they run out of money before the holiday finishes. Um, so it was, t- it was just time to come home, so I decided to come home. And I was only home probably three days earlier than what I was planning on anyway. Well, I can assure you, sitting here in the UK, um, two thousand kilometres is not a short distance. <laughs> well, it still took me three days. From from Birdsville through to Maree was five hundred and fifty, I think thereabouts. From Maree to Mildura was um, nine fifty, which I'd done in the day. And then from from Mildura back to Maui was, I think, it was about seven hundred. So I've, I had three solid days worth of driving. The corrugations um, from Birdsville to Maori didn't help the ribs too much. But the, the drive from Maori through to Mildura was actually a really, a really good drive. Um, it's just long, straight roads. But I, you're going through mountain ranges, through the Flinders Ranges, which is just spectacular. And I cranked a bit of the music and I started to reflect on my trip. Yeah, I was going to ask you, did, did the uh, the Birdsville experience recharge your batteries, which is what you um, hoped to do after the, the difficult period you'd been through? Well, the Birdsville experience started from when I left home and, and went right up through to Ayers Rock and West MacDonald Ranges, you know, and across the top part of northern Queensland down back to Batuta in, and into Birdsville. Um, so that, that 8,000 case just to get to Birdsville was jam-packed full of stuff that I wanted and needed to do to, to um, re-energise and, and kick, re-kickstart where I'll, you know, re-kickstart my life, I guess. Um, and it, it, it did work. And, look, Birdsville in itself was, uh, it's an experience. And I think most people need to go there to, to experience what that place has to offer. It's just not the races, you know. There's there's other things in and around the area that um, that draw it all together, but the races is the draw card. And there's stuff out and about in the outskirts that that I experienced, like Big Red, Fred Brophy, sitting around the campfire with you know with with new new friends, met new people, uh, walking around town, just doing stuff. It was pretty cool. So yes, it did re. Um, it, it kicks. It gave me the start that I wanted, and it, it was. I really cleared my head and made some decisions along the way on where I wanted to, what I want to do when I got, when I get home. And you know, I'm putting those things in place, so it's just it's been really good. And what's it been like back home? You've patted the dog by now. <laughs> my dog couldn't stop the when She was so excited to see me. You know. I was thinking of all these things as I'm leaving Murray, driving down back to Mildura. I'm thinking, what, what, you know, what's what's life going to be back home? I'm sure, I've only been away six weeks, but I've grown a beard, which I'd never do. Um, I was excited to 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 come back home and get started and see my friends and see my family, pat the dog, pat the cats, 
go back to work and start supporting the people that I do with disabilities back, you know, with their life. And as I'm driving down the road between, just as I'm coming through the Flinders Ranges, as I said earlier, the, the scene was, was just spectacular. I've turned up the music and I've started to think about all these little things, all the, just the little things that I've done along the way, and I'm starting to smile. In a few cases, I started to laugh, and it was just really cool. But and I, since I've been home, people have asked, what was the best part of your trip? And it's really hard to pinpoint one actual thing. I didn't know whether the best part was actually leaving home to venture out into the unknown and not really know what I was going to do and where I was going to go. I knew I had a destination. I had one spot for a destination, which was Birdsville, for a time frame. The rest I could move around. And I was just camping willy-nilly along the, you know, along the way, which was really cool. So that I, you know, I could pinpoint a, a dozen, if not more, highlights, but not one was better than the other. Birdsville was, it was a section of, of, of my trip, and it was a really good section of my trip. But it was part of the trip that I was that I wanted to go to. That's why I took the path that I did to get there. It was pretty cool. Was so cool. you'd recommend anyone going to, to Birdsville races? I wouldn't hesitate to recommend that people go to Birdsville. There's, there's three parts to the to the journey in Birdsville. Is you've got Batuta, which is only a week earlier, which is the community racing event. It brings the station people together. That's that's what that's one's all about. Then you've got Baduri, the other side. After after Birds Hill, and again, that's there all the the cattle stations and and the farmers and and small town communities that all come together the other races, and then you got the Birds Hill one, which is the ticket one, probably a little bit more commercialised, and but everybody knows about it. Everybody wants to go there, and they need to go. I think people just need to get in the car and not think about it too much. Don't say oh, I'll get there one day, because one day may may never come. So. Book your ticket, fill up the car, go for a drive. Because it's worth every it's worth every bit of it. I'm gonna do it again. I've got no doubt I'm gonna do it again. I'll take my son with me next time. You know? It was um he's really wanted to, he really wants to go. There was people flying in and flying out this all the time, people with their own on their own planes. Some weren't gonna stay for the races but decided to stay. But people need to to, if it's on their list of things to do, then they need to just block out that week and a half and go and do it. You need to come across, Steve, go and experience yourself. Jump on the plane, mate. Come over. I'll take you around. <laughs> well, thank you very much, um, Andrew, for sharing your uh, memories of Birdsville. Um, despite the uh, the four, uh, four cracked, fractured ribs, it, it sounds like it was worth it. Look, I don't think I'd change too many things. Uh, in fact, I don't, there wouldn't be anything I, I can think of, and I have thought about this a lot, but there's not anything that I'd change along the way. I was, I wanted to go and see people. I wanted to talk to people, and I spoke to a lot of people. But as a result of me, like, leaving Chase Nut Potsy, I met his family, you know. With, with, it, was, it was just awesome. I ended up spending my next week and a half with Potsy's family. We camped together. We drank together. We had a lot of fun together. It was great, you know. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to meet those blokes. It was, but there was so many people, so many people, all out there, just enjoying themselves. I didn't see any trouble, not, not no fights. I didn't see any anyway. People were just enjoying themselves and soaking up the atmosphere. And it's it's that's what it's all about. But going there to a place where you can relax and have a couple of beers and watch the races, which is what they want to do. It was great. Loved every bit of it. Hello, Andrew. Welcome back to the paddock and the pavilion. I've just played our interview of October last year after Birdsville 2022. Did you have no hesitation in going back in 2023? Morning, Steve. Uh, no, mate. Look, it's just one of those things that when you when you experience something like that in the middle of the desert, and um, you, you make friends and you have a few beers and watch the races, it's just it's just exhilarating and exciting. So I was I was pretty keen to get back in the car and, and head back up. The beard's gone. Well, you know, I, I don't normally have a beard, but I was six weeks on the road last year and did about ten thousand k's, and I was 
last thing I wanted to do was pull out a razor. So I just let it go and come back and looked a bit scruffy. So I got it off pretty much as soon as I come home. It's one of the first things I did. And we've just heard on the podcast the previous interview where you talked about your uh, fractured ribs. How are the ribs and how long do they take to recover? Well, I didn't know they were broken. I jumped in the boxing tent, as you know, and um, I didn't know they were broken. But I, I copped a good one in the ribs about the third round. And I can tell you, trying to sleep and pack up a tent and then drive along the Birdshill track with the ruts for 500 odd Ks was, was a bit tough. And I was home for about two weeks before I I went to the doctors and he laughed at me and shook his head and he came back and said, no wonder they're sore, mate. You've got four broken ribs. So <laughs> um, there's nothing you can do except just let them heal. So they took about another four weeks or so once I got home to heal, but all good now. No boxing this year. We'll, go and, we'll just go and spectate, I think. So no boxing in 2023? No, I've, I've, I've retired. So I'm zero from one. And uh, the barrister, who was the, the bloke that I jumped in the ring with, who I stay in touch with, we become friends. And <laughs> I'll no doubt I'll catch up with him, have a few beers and have a laugh about it when we get up there. It's all good. I suppose that's what Bur- Birdsville's all about, though, the friends you meet. Well, actually going to see a few people from last year as well. You know, there was, we, we, we met a couple of bookies. Um, I stay in touch with some of the blokes I met and some friends up in Brisbane, which is a fair hike from here. Uh, no, it's good. It's 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 good fun. So it's and I'm I know I'm going to meet more people up there again from this year, and uh, I'm a little bit of a social butterfly. When I mean, we got out there, I wanted to talk to everybody and experience everything that it offered. So I think I'll probably do the same again this year. I know prior to leaving last year, it had been a difficult time for you personally. Reflecting back now, twelve months since Birdsville, how are things with you now? <laughs> Well, my wife passed, as you know, she's been gone for about four and a half years now. And last year was uh, was a, a regroup um, for me. And it, it certainly did that. And it, it gave me some new experiences and sort of opened my eyes a little bit further and, on what life's all about and how short and how fickle it can be and how quickly it can be taken away from you. So I've sort of lived in the, lived in the moment, certainly from last year, and, and the experiences I gained from being on the road and, and just meeting new people and trying new things was has, has been a really good thing over for, for me for over the past twelve months. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm keen to get out there and, and do it again and just and just live life, I suppose, because it's um it's only a, you're only here for a short time, so you might as well make the most of what you got. And what's the the trip plans this year? It's uh, are you going direct this time? Uh, Pretty much. I'm, I'm going to head up through to Batuta Races. I'm still going out back once I get to, to a place called Broken Hill. I've got about 2,500 Ks just to get to Birdsville. Uh, I'm going to take about a week to get to the Batuta Races, which is uh, more of a community orientated race uh, race meeting. Uh, I'll meet some people along the way. Um, I'll whack me stickers on the car for the roadies. In fact, as, as I'm talking and thinking to you now, I think I'll name my car the Paddock in the Pavilion. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds very good. Yeah, definitely. All right, I'll do that and I'll put the website on there or, or whatever we need to put on there so people can uh, tune in and have a listen. <laughs> That's the best idea yet. Um, so are you packed? Yeah, we're recording here on the 17th of August or 18th of August in, in Australia. Yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow morning, um, Saturday the 19th. So I'll be out of here by about 8 o'clock in the morning. Car's packed. I've just got to um, throw it, go down the street and grab some supplies as far as alcohol is concerned. Um, fill up my fridges, put all my frozen food in the car, and it's just a matter of going to bed and waking up, and away we go. I'm keen as master. Can't wait to get on the road. You've really got the birds filled bug, haven't you? Uh, it's, look, once you go, and Steve, if you've ever come to Australia, you're welcome to come and stay at my joint, mate, and I'll throw a swag on the roof of the car for you. I'll burn you a couple of snags and some eggs in the morning and we'll get going. Eh? Sounds like a plan. Uh, it sounds a long way away, I'm afraid. I've been to Australia lots of times, but um, Birdsville is the middle of nowhere. But um, it sounds like an experience that no one ever forgets once they've been. No, no, it's 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 a, it's something. It's just so nice. You know, there's not a lot. The, the land is barren. Um, the atmosphere is electric. The sun rises and the sun sets are, are just outstanding. And there's a real sense of uh, 
I don't know, freedom, I suppose, when you're out in the road and you pull up anywhere for a coffee or a beer or something to eat and there's always someone that wants to stop and have a chat. So it's it's good because we're all going there for the same thing and it's exciting. It's good stuff. Well, racing at Birdsville this year is on Friday the 1st of September and Saturday the, Saturday the 2nd of September. Hopefully no rain this year. Well, hopefully with no rain. Look, to be honest, the rain last year actually made it uh, – even though it was my first time, it was it, it actually made the event because it, it pushed people away from their campsites and pushed them into the into the town city like the pub and et cetera. And it brought it actually brought people together. And it created an atmosphere at the racetrack where there's three or four bulldozers going around the track, taking off five hundred mil of dirt just to just to get a race just to get to a race surface. Because the, the the red dirt and water that they just don't mix. It just turns to to to, to clay. Um, so they had to go down so deep to to try and find some firm ground for the horses. And the actual Saturday last year was was really good. The sun was out, the wind was out. We got some races done. Uh, it was good. It actually made the event. So I'm looking forward to some sun this year because, as I said, it's a balmy 11 degrees here at the minute and it's raining and I'm rugged up. So tomorrow in the car I'll probably have shorts and thongs and a T-shirt on. Away we go. Well, let's hope uh, you can back a winner and, and- – to cap it all off, um, one of our other guests, John Keating, can ride the the winner of the Birdsville Cup. I'll go and have a chat with John uh, when I get up there <laughs> and see what he can tell me, see if we can get some inside information. Well, thank you again, um, Andrew, for being on the paddock and the pavilion, especially for the offer of putting an advert on your uh, truck. And the very best of luck on the journey to Birdsville and at Birdsville races on the 1st and 2nd of September. Thanks, Steve. Good to talk to you, mate. Thank you for listening for the final part of our Birdsville 2023 series. As an update, Andrew is back at Birdsville. He went racing today, Friday the 1st of September, where he backed a winner in race two. He will be back there tomorrow, hoping to back the winner in the Birdsville Cup. You never know, it could be John Keating who wins his first Birdsville Cup. Podcast Network.